This is the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Company number seven fireless steam locomotive. And if you just didn't say what, you weren't paying attention. I'm Darren, and this is the Industrial Revolution. You heard me right, this is a fireless steam locomotive. They ran just exactly like a regular steam locomotive, but no firebox, no flame, no source of heat at all for this locomotive. So first thing you're going to notice, looking at this locomotive, is that the, the boiler seems sort of oversized. It seems too big of a tank. And yeah, compared to other steam locomotives, it really sort of is. It's, you know, this is far bigger than you would expect. Uh, you have a couple of sand domes on top, the large steam dome on top. That's all fairly normal. Down here, you have your piston, you have your drive gear, or your valve gear, excuse me. You have standard drivers. Everything here looks pretty normal, except there's no firebox when you get to the end. So why would you want one of these? Well, these were actually really useful in places where you were dealing with explosive environments, flammable environments. We had limited ventilation. Uh, if you're working in a, a mine, for example, or you're shunting cars around in a factory uh, inside a building, uh, you don't want that, all that coal smoke. It makes it a little hard for people to breathe and work in there. If you're in an explosive environment, if you're in an area with uh, a lot of flammable materials, uh, you don't want the fire. Uh, these things can cause explosions. It does happen. So instead, you run something like this, which is a, a fireless steam engine. It actually came in a couple of forms. Uh, this is probably the more useful form. problem with filming right next to the main line, of course, is that you have the main line right next to you. It looks like a shipment of coal headed somewhere. So in almost every way, this is a standard steam locomotive, except for the lack of a firebox and a smoke box. Weighs 65 tons, was built by H.K. Porter in 1943. And it's one of two types of fireless locomotives. Uh, the, the other type is perhaps a little easier to understand. Uh, the other type actually ran compressed air. It couldn't hold as much. Uh, for reasons we'll get into here in a minute. Uh, but it did, however, uh, work just fine. The one I've seen has three cylinders of compressed air instead of the one uh, large boiler that you see here. And that had a, uh, you charge that and you'd run off of that instead of steam. Let's take a look up on top here. Unfortunately, we can't go inside this one. But if you take a look inside, you see it's all very similar controls to a standard steam locomotive, except you don't have most of the fireman position.
It's hard to get a good look inside here, but we can do our best here. And you see mostly you have very similar controls. Your throttle, your brake, everything's there. And in the center, if your water gauge tells you what your water depth is, So which is better in a fireless steam locomotive, compressed air or steam? Well, both actually work pretty well in hazardous environments and enclosed environments, although using steam does mean you're pumping a lot of moisture into the area, and depending on the situation that could be either good or bad. And both actually have some, some pretty serious safety and convenience advantages that we'll come to in a minute. One place where they really differ though is in the range. Now you're not taking any fireless locomotive out for, on long trips. Uh, they are strictly for local use. Uh, the switchyard locomotives, shunting locomotives in factories and mines. But the range did vary quite a bit, and here's why. Let's assume you fill up uh, at 300 psi, and for the steam version, you're at 413 degrees Fahrenheit. Assuming we pull steam out at 100 psi into the cylinders. A bit of quick back-of-the-envelope math with the ideal gas law says that each gallon of water will generate about 105 gallons of steam at 300 psi, or about 288 gallons at 100 psi, give or take. Temperature will change that, but that's going to impact air too, so let's just ignore that. So if you want to go the same distance on your compressed air uh, locomotive, how much air pressure do you need? Well, the short answer is you can't. Uh, you'd basically have to compress the air so much that it condensed down to a liquid and under that pressure, even if you found a way to, to compress the air down that far, uh, back when these things were in common use, you're not going to be able to contain it in a cylinder anyway. Still, uh, they were useful. Uh, if you don't want steam venting into your, your factory, for example, uh, these did work and these were in use. Uh, you just had to go recharge them more often. So how do these things actually work? Well, this is your, I guess you call it a fuel port for lack of a better name. Uh, this is where you hook up an exter external boiler. It'd be a large boiler somewhere. And you fill it through here with boiling water under pressure. Uh, this actually took 300 PSI of pressure. Uh, that pushed water into the bottom of here and pressurized the tank also up to 300 pounds, 300 psi of pressure. Now, quick physics lesson here, and this will be quick, sorry, have to do it. Uh, pressure and temperature are really closely related. Everyone knows, you know, boiling point of water is uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, zero, or 100 degrees Celsius. That's the boiling point of water at one atmosphere of pressure. If I take a pan of water right here, and I try to boil it, that's going to be how hot it needs to be to boil. Put it in here though, and now it's under pressure. Uh, the higher the pressure, the higher the boiling point. It actually goes up really quick. I uh, have notes here. Um, at 50 psi, uh, the boiling point of water is 281 degrees Fahrenheit. That's up from 212. At 100 psi, it's 327 Fahrenheit. 200 psi is 379 degrees Fahrenheit. At 300 psi, which is the pressure you fill this to, uh, your boiling point is 413 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, some actually ran even higher pressure. Uh, there's a, a fireless locomotive at the uh, Illinois Railroad Museum, and that one, built by the same company a couple years later, uh, that one runs 400 psi, uh, which is 438 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, how do I know that when they put the water into here, it's at 300 PSI and it's going to be exactly 413 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, the way it works is you put the water in here at 300 PSI and at 413 degrees Fahrenheit, and that means you have steam above it. If you put it in here at, at uh, 300 degrees Fahrenheit and at 300 degrees Fahrenheit, you've got no steam. The water's not boiling. Uh, if you put it in at a higher pressure, well, okay, you don't want to do that. You do bad things to the boiler. Uh, your steam comes out the top through the steam dome, 
and you're at 413 degrees, you're at uh, 300 uh, PSI, take a little steam off the top and the pressure drops on the top. Now that means the, the boiling point of the water that's stored in here drops just slightly and you boil a little bit more water up. Uh, once that water boils, now you're back to equilibrium. Your, your water stops boiling. It's still, you know, in this case, well over 400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's not boiling anymore. It's stable with the temperature that you have uh, here for uh, the steam on top. Now, these things could sit for hours. Uh, you've got a fair amount of insulation here. So you put all that pressurized boiling water in here. These were used for, as switchyard locomotives for shunting. Uh, you never took these long runs. And by one estimate, uh, switchyard and shunting locomotives really only tended to work about 90% of the time, uh, or about 10% of the time. They sat idle about 90% of the time. And that means you really didn't need that much steam. Another thing about this, this can't blow up. Uh, as long as you don't put more than 300 PSI of pressure in here, it's safe. You can walk away from it and ignore it. And the worst that'll happen is it cools down. Uh, so that means you're not having to worry about going over pressure. It means you don't have to worry about the water levels dropping and the thing exploding. Uh, huge advantages uh, if you're working with locomotives, especially where you're potentially, you know, you're running a locomotive for 20 minutes and you're ignoring it for the next two hours before you run it for another 20 minutes. You don't have to keep somebody here watching your temperature and pressure and water level all the time. It's also cheaper. Uh, you might be running several of these around the yard, around the factory, around your mine, and you would simply have one central boiler that you have somebody actually watching all the time, making sure that the water level stays where it belongs, making sure your pressure stays where it belongs. And people that need these would just come fill up you know, a couple times a day, you'd fill this up, and you know, I say you can park it, do whatever you want, and you know, so you save money, it's a lot safer. And you can work in places like mines and in factories uh, without having the problems that you'd have otherwise. So, although these may not have been real common, uh, they were real useful. And even today in places like mines, uh, you're running electric trains. You're not running diesel in a lot of them. Uh, in, in places like factories, again, you're running electric, you're running propane sometimes. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner than diesel. Uh, you're certainly not running coal in any of these places. And because of that, you know, you still have something very similar to this in use today, just running a little bit differently. And that's why this is the Industrial Revolution. Hey, before you go, I do need your help to keep this channel growing. The easiest thing you can do is just like or subscribe to the video. That tells YouTube, hey, this channel is worth watching. It'll show it to more people. Other thing you can do, completely free, is just leave a comment. Uh, more than two or three words is all it takes, and that uh, counts as YouTube interaction. That's the strongest signal you can send to YouTube to re recommend a channel to other people. Beyond that, uh, if you can help out, uh, this channel is actually fairly expensive to run. Uh, I usually drive hour, two hours, three hours each way to get to these sites, so it can get pretty expensive. If you can help out with that, Oh, I have a Patreon page over at patreon.com slash industrial revolution. Uh, there's monthly uh, memberships over there. Or if you're interested in just a one-time uh, contribution to help out, just hit the super thanks button on this video. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next one.